Mm -hmm. and community. That's, and my position is thinking in community is one of the most difficult, least accomplished human skills that ever happened. Universal. Thinking in community is not an easy thing to do. Okay, so um, we've seen this workshop. This is a three day, I will, I'll explain it more later, but this is a three day workshop, usually with people who are not interested in self. Uh, self-development, but are actually interested in performing, getting some work done, and usually in large organizations, and with people who not necessarily uh, work together a lot, but have strong opinions. Um, and this is a way to help get them together and, and to get them thinking in community. And the whole concept is framing your project. You want to frame a large project. Uh, what else do we want to talk about? I don't know, should we just start yeah, with that? Uh, yeah, let's Steve's we'll going to start off a little bit with the human factors, and then I'll show you the tool and a couple of concepts from the tool that I think uh, I'd like you to go away with. So take a look. <coughs> As Dave alluded to, I had a lot of time at uh, Boeing. saw this only a couple of weeks ago, I recognized that this, what's going on in one's own brain is a difficult thing to do because it's not like we can open it up and then we can look at the various parts and pieces. All we can see is the goes inses and the goes outs. Those are technical words. <laughs> and uh, this little video um, shows the goes out us and it shows what's going on in the brain in real time and it becomes a metaphor for thinking in the difficulty of thinking in community. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, listen to uh, Destin. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like a huge man anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the back story. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill, and I was really proud of it. Everything changed, though, 
my friend Marty called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses, and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle, and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Justin Salem. First attempt riding the bicycle. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. <laughs> so here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway, and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks. But after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike, and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird, though. It's like there's this trail in my brain. But if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distraction at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically, and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. <laughs> this is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult? It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike vlog. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a smarter everyday beat up, if you will, and I'm going to see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm going to try to ride a normal bike. <laughs> it's backwards. It's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but at this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. 
But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I've proved is that I can only redesignate that box. And so what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. <laughs> but I need to go deep into this because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm back. Oh, Clay, Clay, Clay. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There's the moment. Okay, I can run a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me, and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes, and I couldn't get it. out for me as a metaphor to the thinking in community. Now lots of us have been in all kinds of meetings and what I'm saying and suggesting on what happens in most business meetings does not approach thinking in community. I'm not saying that it can't happen, but I'm thinking that it's not going to happen. So we're going to dive into some of these details and what um, and an approach to getting to the point of Okay, so ride a bike. Simple, everyone can. One simple change. Hey, I, don't, I know how gears work. So you turn it this way, wheel goes that way. I got all the knowledge I need. Okay, so all I have to do is, is make the wheel just go the other direction and, and, and we're good. Ah. So you make that change, ride a bike, gets to be complex, no one can. And uh, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty solid statement. So everyone can, everyone knows how to communicate. We know how to get along with each other. We've been doing that for a while now. We've been improving how we can talk to each other and behave and not be quite so meaning and sarcastic and all of the politically correct things like that, but thinking in community is like putting a gear in the bike, it's that reversing gear, complex, no one can, and uh, this is the, intended to be the illustration of the community. Thinking always happens with the individual, but when you start, when you put a bunch of individuals together, you have a very different game. And what's going on inside the individual's brain is not accessible. You, s you can see the outcomes that happen through there. And with this bicycle example, we could see the outcome of the brain working. But he had to really struggle to go back to ride the normal bicycle. It took eight months worth of work to make the change to ride the backwards bicycle. What I'm suggesting is uh, working in the normal meeting. So is that the benefit? Or is that a feature? Feature. Fe okay, so the question is, what's the benefit? Well, what's the, what's the benefit? Yeah, the benefit from the customer's point of view is I don't have to wait for a seat. You know, so now, now you're thinking differently. Anything else? You got any other squares like that? Okay, so now, huh? We're good. So now, I'll, I'll, Steve came up with this one. I like this one. Who's the real customer? <laughs> Who defines the benefit? Who defines the value? Right? <laughs> well, I know all cat owners. Okay, I got a dog. I got a dog. Uh, oh, okay. 
So now we're going to talk about who determines the value. And here's another interesting concept is uh, this methodology, value, it's called value engineering. I call it value management. It's, it doesn't have a set name. It's really kind of too bad, but nobody's really identified to give it a good name. So we'll call it value Engineers call it value engineering. Yeah. Awesome. Managers call it value, value management. management. <laughs> That's People on the production car floor call it value analysis. Or value added. Well, not that. So anyways, <laughs> so one of the traditional ones, uh, definitions of value is the function of need divided by the cost. This, Jerry Kaufman, this is one of the things Jerry Kaufman did lately in the 70s, was to add and say, well, what is the function of need? Let's expand that a little bit more. And he's got three different areas. One is called the esteem value, which is which is um, kind of a self-promotion, or, or you know, it's, it's it's nice to have a Sony. You know, it's nice to drive a Mercedes-Benz. Take a look at most of the auto ads that are running currently on, on TV. Most of them are dropping right down there around the esteem value. It's they're trying to enhance the esteem value. <laughs> There's also the utility. You know, most automobiles are, you know, they're gonna they're gonna haul your keister from one area to another, and you, they all basically do that, and that's good. And but that's a need. I mean, it has to be done. And there's an exchange: how much are you willing to pay for it? You know, my first car did not have electric windshield wipers. It had vacuum-based windshield wipers. Anybody ever driven a vacuum-based windshield wipers? Every time you step on the gas or go up a hill, the oh. wipe your stuff working. <laughs> so if it's snowing, you better be prepared. It goes swish, 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 and then you step on the gas and go stop. And you let off the gas real quick and it goes swish, swish, and you step on the gas again so you can keep going up the hill. Mm -hmm. Pre-1955 pre yes. cars. <laughs> My car was a 55 Chevy. First thing I did was go out and buy an electric windshield wiper. <laughs> From the parts place. Okay, so now we can start talking um, in community about a different level. You know, what is the esteem value of whatever we're talking about? <coughs> kind of interesting. Let's take problems or opportunities are usually expressed as symptoms. So one of the really interesting activities is to separate cause from effect. Separate the symptom from the actual opportunity. You know, mainly because if you go out and solve the symptom, it pops back up later. Usually with greater magnitude and more cost, that's a real pain in the rubber. Now, the way they overcome this in this workshop and as we work together as a group and talking about this, so that you know we've refined a lot of material for now in the workshop phase. We're going to answer what they call the three questions. This is always fun to do this in a group. First question is, what's the problem we're about to discuss? Why do you consider it a problem? And what happens if you don't do anything? So what happens in the workshop when I conduct this is, is I start to say, uh, and this is fun when you got a computer and a projector and a PowerPoint. You say, okay, now as a group, tell me what's the problem. What is a Give me a phrase that's the problem. Give me a sentence that may describe it. And I type away. And there's a discussion going on, and I type away. And it eventually gets to a you know complete sentences that make sense. Um, and then we say, is that really the problem? Or is that why is it a symptom? Inevitably. They say, no, that's not the real problem, that's a symptom. So it's not. You know, engineers, engineers don't come down fast enough when they that's, that's kind of interesting. What's the opportunity? So we start over again. What's the opportunity we're talking about? We've got some of the goals and the attributes and stuff. And about the third time, that same thing happens. We write another statement. And we say, is that really the problem? Is that the opportunity? Yeah. It happens. About the third or fourth time, we finally get a decent answer. One that makes sense. Uh, the great, the great uh, thing about this whole process is once they get this, which is great that they have now are away from symptoms and into the actual cause or into the actual uh, opportunity that they have, the, the symptoms are already done. So you've actually completed it by getting this part right here. This one here, this can get interesting. Sometimes people kind of ignore this. You know, 
what happens if we go through anything? What do we do? In a big organization, that's somewhat irrational. But if it's really an important project, the the debrief at the beginning, but from the executives, will will give you some answers at the end because they've already identified. They're paying for this for the group to do this. There should be a problem if we don't do anything. Anyway, so that, that's a lot of fun. Okay, how's my time doing? When are we done? 11.30? Mm -hmm. I got 25 minutes. Okay. Oh, I did that. One of the things, okay, we're going to, this is a big picture. Don't get excited about this, please. I'm going to go through this, and then we're going to come back to this big picture. I wanted to give um, an idea about where we're going. And this is where Charles, by the way, this was his contribution to this whole methodology, was something called a function analysis systems technique. And I don't know why they came up with a fast model, because it is anything but quick. <laughs> it is not fast. Um, at the workshop at the end, I'm gonna, I should have done it before now, was that uh, many times this workshop occurs uh, with managers after they've tried everything else and nothing's worked. And this is a problem, there's a problem that's been around for years and they can't get a result. They've tried everything else. So they finally say, fine, I'm tired of Put the people in the room and don't let them out until they come up with an answer. Okay, so this helps. So what we're doing now is we're helping organize all this type of stuff. So there, one of oh, let, let's break this down. This is not a flow chart. This is a fast uh, function model. Um, what we do is we ask the questions: How goes this way? Why goes this way? This isn't a sequence of activities. <coughs> it, it's, it's functions organized together. The blue box up there is a function. A function. Written in two words. An active verb and a measurable noun. We're going to show you that here in a minute, which makes it very difficult. And then we organize. Uh, Jerry Kaufman added some of this at the bottom. Okay. Maybe uh, Charles, by the way, did also. What you do once you have the functions determined, we can come down and uh, matrix this in to some sort of matrix. This happens to be a customer service model for an internal consulting company, company or an internal consulting group in a large corporation. And they have the functions and they've identified different areas within their organization that need to be R and marketing, sales, subject matter experts, so on. This is one matrix. What's great about this matrix is the black solid dot is the people that are responsible for the C. Two, people that are responsible to achieve that function. They don't care. Well, sometimes I shouldn't say they don't care. It's just they don't need to be involved. Sometimes when there's two black, when you're figuring this out, you'll find if there's two black dots, two places or organizations to think that they are the owner. And if there's no dots on it, nobody's looking at it. And sometimes that can be the big issue. break this down a little bit further. Okay, so let's let's begin some of the real brain twisting that goes on with this type of activity. One of them is how do you define a function? Okay, it's the intent or the or purpose. It's the intent in its normal habitat, its normal activity. Okay, the action of the function is is the activity. I know that doesn't make much sense. So let's go through an example. What is the intent of a screwdriver? Handheld screwdriver. Is it to turn screws? It's to, yeah, most people. To turn screws, right? That's what most people 
That's what most people think. That's the that's the intent or the function of the of the screwdriver. Okay. Oh, slide is going up. Okay, that's actually an activity. Turning a screw is actually a trick activity. You need to go to a higher level of abstraction to get the intent of that activity. Go ahead. So it's take it out and put it in. Is yeah. The intent. Okay. No, no, that's it's that's, that's still coffee. turning a screw. Yeah, it's holds two things together. It's to take the screw in and take put it or into there. It is, but that's the activity, right? Well, turn the screw, put it in, put it out, whatever. That's the to activity. make an assembly, to assemble or, or, something, or disassemble. Or disassemble. Or disassemble. Yeah, or disassemble. But those are real level, low level activities. Think at a higher level of the abstraction. By the way, this one got me the first time I saw it. I heard this one, so I could. Okay, I'm going to go back to where you said join two materials. Join two materials. That's even a lower level activity. And, and that's something. what the screw does. So the so worker to get his work done. Me something. To make something. Physical. Well, let's. Do you want to keep guessing, or do you want no, me to? No, no. Let's go. Let's okay. Start our misery. Okay, I put you out of your misery. Oh. The purpose of the screwdriver is to transmit torque from your wrist <laughs> to the screw. Okay. Now, once you start thinking in that manner, uh, other possibilities are created. Okay, we're going to go, here's another example. Pretend this is a piece of steel, right? a steel strap hand. Looks like this. There's a load here and a bend right here. Okay, the description is that it's a steel blank. So what's the function of the steel blank? to the higher function level, now you say, let's let's design something that supports the load, resists cor corrosion, and allows it to cast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw some people do this and ended up with, you know what zip ties are? The yeah. nylon wire things. And mm -hmm. that, they replaced it with steel handles with a zip tie. Oh. It was interesting. Well, that slide you had earlier, what, what does it do, what does it cost? Yeah. Okay, so once we have identified all the, this list of um, functions, okay, so we've listed several functions at hand, there's more, but I'm not going to go into it. We need to put them in some sort of relationship to each other. Many times, what we're trying to do is map these functions. A, a function has a relationship to another function, has a method, in this direction, and we, under, we understand the relationship of what we're looking at to the previous one of the how statement by asking the how statement. How is this function accomplished with this function? It goes this way and say, why? Why do you do this function so you can accomplish this function? This is the goal. Okay? So, going on a bunch of stuff we did in the workshop that we don't have any shirts, but right. when we're done, 15 minutes, maybe a little bit of time. So we're going to do a little bit. Of, uh, let's begin. Just here they, you can't see it from back there, but the function map's up here. Here's the matrix in of whatever they determined down at the bottom. They're trying to figure all this stuff out. All right. Uh, hang up for just a moment. Back up. One of the tools of thinking in community everybody around the board visual and able getting everybody to see the same thing at the same time that is not the only tool for thinking in community right we have a number two pencil wooden pencil right we're going to create a function map of that we have a description of various activities what is the uh, oh I'm sorry what they have is what they call the base function and secondary function you can't do the base function. The secondary functions are you know, might as well worry about it. Okay. Uh, in this case, the base function of a pencil is to make marks. Okay, because writing is or data collecting is another level we're not going to get into. Make marks is all it is. And that's the base function. You have to do that on a scope line. But then we have when 
can say, when, when you accommodate, or when it makes March, you accommodate her like me. And she can put these together. Steve, you want to, can you jump in here for a minute? So, so I can take a sip of water. So the activity um, in the workshop that we did yesterday, where the participants got to figure out what these words were, and it takes, realistically, you're going to struggle at it. Somebody else has done the work here, on it, but what I want to be sure that you walk away with the sense is the sense of um, understanding that um, it's, it's really worth it to work on these two word active verb measurable noun functions. When you get these functions in and you get them mapped out, and that's what you want, that's what you're going to do now, is you're, you are going to take these functions and build a map. And um, we can take a two functional so I'm doing them here at, uh, at random. I'll put these two functions up there um, side by side. How do I make marks? I accommodate the grip. Eh. Why do I accommodate grip to make marks? Well, it's probably not so. So, so the fun for you now is for you as a group to take these functions and make sense out of them. You notice it's backwards from most flow charts. If you've done flow charting, it's backwards. Yeah. We're not doing, we're not, yeah, getting out of the mindset of activity. Yes, we want to get you thinking differently. This, this, this is different thinking. So come on down and uh, start uh, grabbing these and moving them around and see if you can make sense out of them.
making marks of the yes. pencil. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then where it goes, like the place you didn't want it. And well, you probably could do that after you have um, a mark on the paper. So the display info improves improves appearance. And the support, so the, the, the support lead is pro and the protective wood is to support the lead. Right. Protecting the wood and the improved appearance, right? The paint protects the wood yeah. and, and mm -hmm. improves appearance. So those two and things also, together, I don't know where they get also, to get those. It also supports the lead. Support the lead. Yeah. So that's why. That right. Helps. Why do you protect the wood? Display yeah. info is um, why do you support protect the wood to improve the appearance of the Yeah. Because when you but then the wires on the left and the left and the right the right over here. Oh, yeah. 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 Do you see what's going on right here, right now? You guys are thinking in communities at this at at this moment in time. So we're gonna call this exercise right now for sake of time. And are we close to the answer though? Yes. Yay! Because he no. can't find his way that way. 
Yeah. When he's working with functions. Yeah. Everybody's working with functions. Everybody's got to come and agree with it. And if you don't agree, you know, you have the permission to do this. And lots of that should happen. And somebody else will come along and do and put that back. And you so the rest of the team's got to focus and really think that through. How do these function? How and why? Maybe this maybe there's a function that's missing. Maybe the functions are too detailed or not detailed enough for the issue at hand. Those are those are struggles, but they bring thinking and community together. Yeah. Yeah. We can talk about this at the, at the break. Okay, we're at the end. Can I show you two more or two? Yes. Two more slides. One more slide is this is a function map mm. of of uh, the value management process. This entire eight day process I was telling you about. This is a function map of it. Wow. It's one of the great things is the this methodology, you can use the methodology on itself. A lot of places don't, you can't do it. A lot of places won't do it. This group did it. And I have a couple of copies of this if you want to see. Okay, is it in one of the slides? Can you give us a slide? It'll, it'll, it'll be in the top. 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 different words. I didn't get into the definition. I went right files. Yeah. These are gates. You know, this is where you start and you, what you do before you do. Here's a scope line. You know, you can get very complicated. Mm. Yeah. All right. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions when we get a chance to really look at that map. Because I'm interested in that. Well, you can. Give us a call. <laughs> this whole methodology came from, um, here's the, here's, this is a nice little book. He's got a copy of it so you can see it. Jerry Kaufman wrote a book. This is an old one. This is a new, new one. Uh, one of the things, if you ever read Jerry Kaufman's book, it's very thin. Oh, okay. He tells you the tools. Oh, that's huge. But he tells you the tools, but he doesn't tell you how to do it. There you go. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. So it's a map, it's not a territory. It's, yeah, it's a map, it's not a territory. One more, one more item, and then you can go. We're gonna, we got to get out of here. I think he's a link. This is not based on all of the manufacturing. Remember the consulting company, the internal consulting company that mm -hmm. I was telling you about? Here is their map for customer service. But here is, they also decided to do infrastructure. So what, how do you, there's a forward facing to the customer and then there's a deliverable, a delivery. So they, they broke it off into two. The really fun part was we told them about this great long process to do all this stuff. As soon as they did these maps, they said, okay, we're done with you, go away. <laughs> and they uh, operated. They operated based on this uh, knowledge of this map for about a year and a half. Of course, they folded it up and put it away. And then they got confused. And then they said, hey, "Remember that map we did a year and a half ago? Why not that? Yeah, bring that up. Let's put it." And they redid it. Okay. So yeah, the knowledge that they had learned in a year and a half. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they reevaluated. But it was, um, yeah, it's it's not pure manufacturing. It's not pure. Uh, technology. This is the structure of an organization. Okay, how far can we go over? We're going to stop talking. Time's up. Time's up. Time's up. Time's up. Um, what I wanted to offer is as a thanks oh. to these gentlemen. Wait a minute. We have a part? One more. Oh, go ahead, Steve. Uh, just one thing. I, I brought us back to the beginning. This down here at the bottom is the URL to the thought piece that we wrote in the, for the preparation of this program. Uh, we presented it with the Intuit thinking. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion. The call, it, 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 and we did when well, we presented it in, in April. But there's uh, this. I have I have just my one uh, working copy of it. But uh, there's uh, about 15 pages in this paper. It'll be in Bill's uh, email to us that we use on the discussion. Oh, yeah, if you go back to yeah, the April, it's online. April. It's online somewhere. Yeah, it's online. Yeah, it's online. Okay. It's it's through in. Ongoing discussion, I think April of 2015. And our names and, and contact information is on that paper. Feel free to contact us. And as 
a thank you. Uh, Greg has been doing artwork of each of the sessions. He did these beforehand, not knowing exactly what the sessions were. <laughs> but if you have the time and energy, if you'll sign it, we will present it to our presenters. Thank you for sticking with us. Hey, how are you doing? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How are we going to get the slides? Can we email you? How are we going to get the slides? They're going to get posted. Or Bill also. Uh, uh, are they going to get posted? Yeah. If you want, if you want to give me your email address. The presenters I'll that say okay with host, if they say no, I don't want to hang on to my slides, they're going to post them. So there's a lot of links, there's a forums done, all that stuff gets put on.